welcome to Fresh Outlook on this first week of March. I'm Mia Toski. But we have a lot to talk about this week. We can begin first with Ukraine. Now, all eyes were on the Sochi Games and Vladimir Putin for the past two weeks. Now, many are wondering about the dangerous game the Russian president is playing now. Putin received unanimous approval for a military intervention in Ukraine, despite strong objections from the U.S. So the question is now, what will the United States do next? The Ukrainian parliament has chosen Arsenya Yatsenyuk as the country's new prime minister. He must find a way to restore stability in a country that is on the verge of financial collapse. Taking into account the high responsibility of the cabinet of ministers, I vow to be faithful to the Ukrainian people and I am taking the responsibility to follow the Ukrainian constitution. In an address to Parliament, the new Prime Minister has asked the signatories to the Budapest Memorandum to guarantee the territorial unity of Ukraine. That treaty was signed by Ukraine, Russia, the U.S. and U.K. in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal. 39-year-old Yatsenyuk has served as economy and foreign minister and parliamentary speaker. He says the country's future lies in the European Union, but with friendly relations with Russia. Meanwhile, Russia has scrambled fighter jets to patrol its border. It has announced measures to tighten security at the headquarters of its Black Sea fleet. Elsewhere in Crimea, pro-Russian gunmen have stormed government offices in Simferopol. Yatsenyuk has made it clear that Ukraine doesn't want to fight with Russia, but insists the country wouldn't accept the secession of the Crimea region. And to talk more about this dangerous situation, we welcome former White House aide Didi Benke, media analyst Jackie Guzda, and we also have down in Washington, D.C., we have... Uh, Alexander Rage, she is the president of Trace International, that is the global anti-corruption and anti-bribery organization. We welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Well, this is certainly uh, escalated. We talked last week about Ukraine, and the question that we had from Alan Topol uh, down in D.C. was, what happens if Russia sends troops into Ukraine? Is Russia essentially declaring war? I think he's going back to the USSR. I think Putin wants world domination, and he takes the Olympics. And I mean, it goes fairly well, I guess, even though it's in a terrible location. And then now there are actually already troops there. He's already invaded. He's already in Crimea. So I mean, this is already going on, and it's clear that he wants to dominate the areas that the USSR dominated before. And actually, it's very disappointing because President Obama is saying, well, there'll be a cost. Really? No one believes him. It's a joke, unfortunately. Well, I think a lot of people are saying because he had tough talks uh, about Syria, but nothing really nothing came happened. Nothing happened. Uh, so a lot of people are looking as to what he is saying and whether his words are going to lead to action. Uh, Jackie, your thoughts? Well, look, what can he do? Right now, our hands are tied. He talked tough before, but right now, he's got to watch what he says. He doesn't want to look like a weak uh, president over here. The fact is, we need Putin. He's got influence now in Iran. He's got influence in Syria. Well, do we need Putin? No, we don't we need Putin. Putin is the problem. What's Putin the is the enemy. Well, not Putin. Well, are you kidding me? And let's go back to President Obama. This is an important point. Of President Obama should well, not well, say there are costs when there will not be. Wait, that it makes us look weak. But let's go back. Look, let's go back to that point. What can he do? What well, can uh, Obama well, don't say you're going to do minute. something if you're not going to do it. He didn't say it. Yeah, he, he said there would be cost, just like the red line. That didn't would, happen either. Let's Wait. talk about the options in, in just a little bit. Yes. The question was, is he declaring war? No. He, he sent troops in there. Uh, he, I think he is. No, and he's we, just doing his... his uh, semi-hostile takeover. And, and we, we do want to say hi there, Dr. Moresco. Nice <laughs> to see you. That was a wonderful. So good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Hello. Nice to see you again. Well, we are talking, of course, uh, about what is dominating the headlines right now. Um, a very uh, s a scary situation, I think a lot of people might say, um, with uh, the situation in, Mos in uh, Ukraine. And the question that I have for, for everybody to, right now is, is Putin declaring war? No, Putin won't declare war because there are some immediate geopolitical and foreign policy implications that are that that uh, are associated with that. What Putin will likely declare is that he will be uh, much like what happened in Georgia, 
in the summer of 2008, he will declare something to the effect that this will be a humanitarian intervention. Yes, he's already said <laughs> that. Oh, yeah, right. He's sure. protecting Russians. He's already come out and said that. The Russians who are on his side already. But this is a very strategic point, port also yes. in Crimea. Um, obviously, he wants that control again, which was once in Russian control. So the question is, what if he continues to push even further? Well, I mean, the push further is linked to a yet broader geopolitical uh, and potentially regional uh, factor, and that is uh, Russia's military and economic interests are being severely challenged. And this is in part partially linked to what's been going on in Syria. Russia has one of its most strategic warm water ports in the eastern Mediterranean. That looks for the moment as if it's secured through the chaos that's been, that's been caused both by the United States but obviously by, by international Islamists and Russia's involvement. The challenge now again is another military installment now linked to ethnic Russians is under serious challenge by, by the demonstrations that took place in, in Kiev over the last weeks and months. And so what's happening is, is a hypersensitive reaction on the part of Moscow just to look after its interests. And if we were to denationalize debate and just not call it Russia but any other state, I'm not sure the U.S. would act that much different if any of its military bases would be challenged so robustly. Okay. Uh, now, what about uh, if, if he does continue to push further, and I say past Crimea? Of course he's pushing. I mean, he's already occupied Crimea. He's already there. And he is going to continue. And I think that people in Georgia would say, yeah, he declared war. He doesn't want, they don't, the Georgians, they didn't want him to take over. And these people they in Ukraine, they, people in Ukraine, they, they did, the no, no, people yeah, they in Ukraine. They launched the, the missile Let me launches. finish. People Georgian in Ukraine, they, Russian believe me, the people, the nationalists, they do not want Putin anywhere near that. They want to have their own country. They don't want Putin to come in and take over. No, you should read that the was European, the problem. You should that read is the why, European Union report Why do you think the guy got kicked out? What guy? The president. Yanukovych? Yes. Yeah, he was removed from power, absolutely. But we want to welcome, uh, we just are told that we uh, do have Alexandra Rage. She is the president of Trace International, the global anti-corruption and anti-bribery organization. She is also the author of Bribery and Extortion, Undermining Business, Governments, and Security. We welcome you to the show and thank you very much. We're talking about Ukraine right now and obviously the very tense situation and uh, whether or not President Obama's words are tough enough and is, uh, is uh, the president, President Putin that is, is he pushing uh, the, the uh, President Obama? I, I'm sorry, I'm joining this a little bit late, so I'm jumping in midstream, but, you know, of, of course, um, my area of expertise is, is, is corruption, and it sounds like you've got the political science experts already online. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back to you. Okay, let's sure. talk about um, <laughs> the question is, is Putin pushing how, how far do you think Putin is going to continue he, to push Obama? He, he knows where his limits are. Uh, specifically, I mean, we keep concentrating on Putin, but really probably the main player here is the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, who is a very experienced diplomat. He's been doing this sort of thing for 20 years. He was very influential in, in the Kosovo War in 1999, in Georgia, and many other issues. He's a highly, highly talented uh, diplomat. Whether we, we agree with the things he are saying that he says is another thing. But he also knows the limitations of international law. And I do not see, if this does take place under the rubric of humanitarian intervention, then that explanation becomes much weaker if he moves anywhere beyond where there are less than majority of ethnic Russians. I, uh, think, I think there are limitations to well it. Well, now Senator Corker and a lot of other Republicans especially are very concerned about it. And even President Obama says he is, but I don't think he'll do anything about it. I think it's just... What do you want him to do? I don't want him to say he's going to do something I, and not no, no, do no, no, it. Not what you don't want. What do you want Obama to well, do? Well, let's what talk action? about some of the options that Obama has put on, the, the, that the U.S. has said uh, not attend the G8. Um, is that really going to matter to Putin? Well, I don't think he cares. <laughs> no, I, I think, think Putin cares at well, all. These are, these are just some of the about options that are being explored thinks. right no, now. But, right. But he what wants, are the options? Yeah, he wants to show off what he's done in Sochi. He wants, that's his part. He wants mm -hmm. all the players to come. Yeah, it'll be a little bump against him. I don't think it's going to be a big bump. I would agree. I think these are the first symbolic steps along a diplomatic protocol. The U.S. has a whole set of mechanisms to get the message that this is not something that is condonable. And obviously, it is a very complex scenario. And if there wasn't an ethnic Russian issue, then this would be a highly, a highly problematic breach of international and, law. And I think a lot of people don't understand the area of Crimea. I mean, they have their own 
their own uh, prime prime minister, their own prime minister. It's an autonomous region right. that was given by uh, by then Soviet President uh, uh, Khrushchev, virtually as a gift. He himself was Ukrainian, and in about 1956, I believe this 54. was given. 54. Sorry. Okay, pardon me. Thanks for the correction. 54. It was given in a uh, highly under-celebrated, uh, this was just kind of saying by Moscow, you know, let's slightly redraw the but maps. But don't you think that people it. don't like being told that they were given to Putin or given to someone? I mean, just the way you're even talking, I mean, the, the Crimea is, is different than the rest of the country because there, you, you do have more Russians there instead of, uh, you know, as far as like the historic part of it. However, that's the easy mark and that's the strategic mark because they're right by the Black Sea. So that's really why, you know, he's well, invaded. I, say, I the, mean, it's Putin such a has invaded. Port. They're yeah, but, already there. But there's a broader issue is that geographically, if you were to look at a, a type of ethnic demographic breakdown, that largely Eastern Ukraine is is pro-Russian. They're ethnically many areas that are that are majority Russian. And and this really is hauntingly similar to what happened in Yugoslavia in yes, August of absolutely. 1991, right. a case that I know particularly well. Uh, and this is will it sounds that some of the vocabulary and the terminology is is we will protect our ethnic bre brethren who are living in a new state who's undergone a very serious revolution and if our ethnic bre brethren are not guaranteed some sort of basic rights uh, which happened to Serbs in Croatia and, and or Serbs in Kosovo uh, and equally other m ethnic minorities then there is this sort of trump card of, of ethnic protection, which is exactly what Russia played in, in, in Georgia but, and played it very well. But let's talk about Russia right now. I was speaking to an 87-year-old woman who's, who's li been living over there, and a lot of people are very worried about this escalation yeah. and, and whether or not this is the right thing to do. Um, it certainly is uh, creating an east-west type of fight, and it certainly brings back some uh, everybody's saying the Cold War. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, com it's, it's coming back. So. I, I don't think that all Russians are in favor of this. No, no, so, he's not. I don't think no, no. he's saying that. No, no, no. But I'm saying so. The, the, so Putin's actually on a very fine line within his own country as well. Yeah, protecting and taking over are two very different things. And this is Putin's history. He's done this over and over and over again. I don't know why you think he's going to change. People don't change. We'll see what happens. You know, and hopefully what you're saying is true, but I don't think so. I think he's going to go for it. I think he but wants see, the USSR back. Look, here's the problem. If he keeps oh, he on going does. for it. He made yeah, that yeah, no, he, he, wants, he wants it back in the day. But look, here's the problem. If he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, and if you want Obama to step up and step up, we're going to be in World War III before this segment okay, is over. Okay, so then let Putin just take over these people, no, like, that's, just like Syria, just like, that you know, doesn't make we don't do anything. But this so I know it doesn't. And this all started with the $15 billion bailout uh, several months ago that he gave to Yanukovych, um, which brings us to the question of corruption. Um, and we want to go back to D.C. right now and talk about that and, and talk about how widespread corruption is in many of the other overseas countries, whether it's more for the... Uh, uh, lower economic countries, or is it? Is it how widespread is it? Well, really, the, the challenge is is not <laughs> where is the problem. The problem is everywhere. Corruption is just theft, right? So the challenge is finding out where there's both opportunity and impunity. Is there the chance to put your hand in the till, and then on the other side, do you think you'll get away with it if if you do? And so, in countries with less robust rule of law, that's a particular problem because the people who can reach for the cash do it and know that if they have to, they can buy off the police, they can buy off the judges, they can buy their way out of the problem. So Ukraine's certainly not alone mm -hmm. in, in this issue, but it does lead to extraordinary public uh, frustration when they know that their, their government is for sale. Well, this brings me to a question about what we're going to be talking about next week on here. What are your predictions for what's going to happen in this region?